All right, folks, I'm struggling here. I got sick. I never get sick. I never, ever get sick. I don't remember the last time I was sick. And some people say that like, oh, look at me, I'm Superman. I have the greatest immune system ever. That's not, that's not the, yeah, that's not the case. I never get sick because I'm a hermit and I avoid human contact at all costs. So I'm usually not around people enough to get sick. But man, something got a hold of me. Been to the gun store a couple times over the last week or so. Been to the grocery store. Maybe I brought home something more than groceries. It, it all started uh, during the live stream I did a couple days ago. I was feeling all weird, man. Feeling loopy and couldn't concentrate. And we ended the stream a little earlier than I otherwise normally would have. And then yesterday, man, it hit me. It hit me like a ton of bricks. Got a little fever going on. Feeling like crap. Super low energy. A low energy person. For him to get things done is hard. But here's the thing, man. Tomorrow's Sunday, and I want a video to put up on Sunday. Sundays are good days. My Sunday videos generally get good views, right? People are watching on Sunday. So that's today. That's today's video. This is the lowest effort video I could think to make. I think I had previously mentioned that, you know, we were going to be doing 223 next, and that is in the plans. Another Mark 262 video coming really soon, but today for the easiest video I could possibly think of, it, we're going to go with 6.5 Creedmoor. I've got some nice ones fired brass that wouldn't take a lot of prep. I've got a gun that's sighted in and the scope's just the way I want it and it should just be easy. So I'm, we're going to continue the work with the 143 grain Hornady ELDX bullet. We shot a little bit of these guys with some Reloader 17. We've shot a group with H4350 back in the first video. So we've shot a handful. I want to shoot some more today. And the powders for today, first up is going to be Hodgson H4350. What I want to do is shoot this guy and also IMR4350, just to compare them. They're definitely not direct replacements for one another, right? You look at the, at the load data out there, the maximum charge weights with IMR4350 are generally a little bit higher, which should mean that IMR4350 is maybe just a touch slower burning than H4350, but H4350 is one of these Hodgson Extreme Powders, which is supposed to be more temperature stable and that sort of junk. And that's another thing that a lot of people ask me about, and I haven't done enough testing, but that's going to be a video coming sooner rather than later, is a temperature sensitivity video. And these two powders will definitely be part of that video. But for today, we're just going to shoot them straight up. We're going to see if we can find some good loads with them. Now, our last video where we shot the 135 grain Burger Classic Hunter, IMR4350 was outstanding as far as accuracy. It outshot uh, Reloader 17, I think is what we were shooting. Well, what the hell were we shooting? Yes, Reloader 17 was the other powder. And IMR4350 gave us the better accuracy out of those two. As you can tell, I'm already priming. Like I said, low effort, low energy video. I'm gonna be skipping stuff. The jokes are gonna be few and far between and probably even more lame than normal. So this brass, our die was already set from the last video. I resized the brass, put it, put it through my Hornady full length resizing die, bumped the shoulder about a thousandth of an inch. These are once fired, so this is the second firing on these guys. They don't need trimmed yet. They're all still nice and short. I scraped the, the crap out of the primer pocket, and now I'm putting a new primer in there. And I hit the inside of the neck with a chamfer tool just to make sure that the, uh, that the new bullet's going to go in there nice and easy. As far as load data, going to be shooting almost directly out of the Hornady manual. With the 143 grain ELDX and h 4350, they show a max charge of 41.5 grains. I also went to the Hodgton website. 
They don't have the 143 grain ELDX. They do have the 142 grain Sierra Match King. Eh, close enough for a comparable. And the max charge is exactly the same, 41.5 grains. We've already shot this combination with H4350 at 40.5 grains and we didn't blow our face off. So I feel good about that level at least. So what I wanna shoot is 40.3 up to 41.5, which is our max charge. And I wanna do 3 tenths of a grain increments. And we'll just see what happens. We, we haven't pushed this gun far enough yet to even find out what the, what the pressure signs are gonna look at when we do hit pressure. Today might be the day, I don't know, 41.5 grains. I'm not saying I wanna hit pressure signs, but you know, it could happen. We're gonna keep our eyes open. So over to IMR4350, the Hornady manual shows 42.0 grain max charge. And if we go over to the Hodgton website with that Sierra data, they show 41.7 grains and it being a compressed charge. So whether they didn't go farther because of the, you know, they hit case capacity or whether they actually saw pressure, it doesn't look like the, the pressure number is showing 58,600 PSI on the Hodgton website. So they didn't quite push it all the way to pressure and it looks like maybe that was just due to case fill. But gonna stay a little bit conservative here. What I wanna shoot, I wanna shoot uh, the exact same charge weights we shot with H4350, except that I wanna go one step farther. I wanna shoot up to 41.8. So we're starting 3 tenths of a grain hotter and we're going uh, 3 tenths of a grain hotter on the top end. So 40.6 up to 41.8. That'll give us four charge weights where we shoot the same charge with both powders so that we can directly compare our results and see if they match what the manuals and stuff seem to indicate, which is that IMR uh, 4350 is a little slower burning. So I think for a given charge weight, we'll probably see H4350 maybe have a little higher velocity, but we're able to go to a higher max charge with, a, with IMR 4350. Does that make sense? Probably not. So that's, that's the plan. That is the plan for today. I'm gonna to finish up priming these, these guys and then I'm gonna start weighing out powder. Oh, and just like the previous videos, we're using Starline brass that has small primer pockets. And in those small primer pockets, we are using CCI number 450, small rifle magnum primers. That's the primer we've kind of decided to start with here as we get started with 6.5 Creedmoor, and it's doing a great job so far, it seems like. As soon as I finish up priming here, I'm gonna start weighing out powder, and we'll be on the range here in no time. Somebody had asked in the uh, comment section of a previous video why I had stopped using the large WAOAW scale. Because the last last couple videos, I've been using this guy, the little one. This guy is like uh, 18 or $20, and I think this guy was about 30 bucks. I've reviewed them both recently and they're both really excellent. And I'll tell you what, somebody had mentioned that their, that their small one like this had started drifting on them. And I'm curious to hear, like those of you who bought these, are you experiencing that as well? Mine is still rock solid. This, this scale has been extremely impressive for me. It's very fast to use, like it you know gives you readings very quickly. And I haven't had any problems with it, but one thing I, I kind of remembered when he said he started having problems, I'm still using the batteries that came with mine. And I'm curious whether maybe that that's making a difference. Maybe we're getting to the point where people's batteries are starting to get weak. So that was my recommendation or question to him was had he changed his batteries yet? And maybe that would, uh, that would help out. But so far this guy's still be still been doing great for me. And if it's not doing great for you guys, please let me know down in the comments so I can stop telling people to buy it. Because at this point, this is my universal recommendation for a scale. It does an awesome job. Now the larger version reads down to 0 0.02 grains. Like, yeah, I'm not sure if I got the, the camera or the glare and everything just right, but this one's reading 40.92. Right now I'm measuring 40.9 grains. A couple reasons why, a lot of times, man, when I'm just wanting to load fast or, or whatever, I grab that scale instead of this one. For one thing, my Frankfurt Arsenal uh, Trickler, which is the, the Trickler I really like to use, isn't tall enough to reach over the pan on this guy. So whenever I wanna use this scale, I have to add a little 
spacer, I don't know, somewhere along the way I found a little piece of plastic that fits inside of the base of the Frankfurt Arsenal trickler and lets it clear it. So that's kind of the first problem that makes me grab that scale sometimes is I'm, I'm, you know, I don't feel like screwing around with my trickler. And the other problem is, well, exactly what I'm doing here right now. Like, whenever I see that additional resolution of the 0 0.02 grains, I can't help, like I'm an obsessive person, I can't help but try to get it as perfect as I can. Now on a tenth of a grain scale like that one, it's a whole lot easier than on a 0 0.02 grain scale like this one. A lot of times though, I love that. I want to get them perfect. I want to get them all exactly as close as I can. But I have serious doubts as to the usefulness of that. All right, so before I had this scale, I used a Gem Pro 250. I've actually owned two different Gem Pro 250s and used those a whole lot on the channel. And I think I've just reached a point where I don't know how much difference it's making in my loads. Obsessing over every gra granule of powder it doesn't seem to help my standard deviations. It doesn't help seem to help my group size all that much. So sometimes, you know, I just, I grab the 10th of a grain scale. It allows me to work faster. I feel less obsessive <laughs> as I'm weighing my charges. And you know what? We still shoot pretty good groups and we still get pretty decent SD numbers. So that's kind of, that's been the mood I'm in lately. My, my mood shifts a lot. Like I'll obsess over something for a month or two and then decide that, yeah, that's not worth obsessing over. So I'll switch everything up. That's why it's, it's dangerous to listen to me. I'm just an idiot. <laughs> just a random idiot on YouTube. I don't know what I'm talking about. But if you happen to buy this scale and you're wondering why I'm not using it, it's nothing bad. Like I'm, I'm still happy with the scale. It does like, like, you know, if you weigh something out and you lift the pan and set it down, it likes to, you know, the, the, the weight does vary generally by 0.02. It'll, it, you know, it's, it's hard to get it to just give you the exact same reading over and over. So I think the, you know, the mechanics of the scale are not quite precise enough for this 0 0.02 resolution that they gave us. Like if this was a 0 0.05 scale instead of a 0 0.02, I think it would be friendlier to use. But as long as you can kind of internally like know that, okay, I'm within 0 0.04 of my target. That's about as good as I'm probably going to get with this scale. Like here's one, 40.90. I lift the pan, I set it back down, 40.90. It's gonna make a liar out of me here. There you go, 40.92, 40.92, 40.90. So it, you know, it'll, it'll vary a little bit, but it's still giving me more precision than a 0.1 scale can can give me. It's just not quite as stable as the uh, as the Gem Pro 250, but it also costs five times less. So I'm still good. I still recommend this scale, and you're still going to be seeing me use it a lot. But then again, you might see me using this scale a lot as well. I love them both equally. You know, it's like your kids. They have different personalities. You love them equally, or at least that's what you tell them. All right, so I've got nine more. One good thing about it though, is it doesn't seem to drift zero on me. N neither of the scales do. Like once I dump the charge and put the pan back on, it's always back to 0, 0.0. And that's the frustrating part that I've uh, experienced with a lot of other scales. Because when you put the pan back on and it doesn't read zero, now your previous charge that you just thought was good and that you just dumped, now you have to bring it into question. So I really like the fact that they seem to hold zero pretty well. All right, so I've got nine more charges to obsess over here and we'll be ready. We'll be ready to seat some bullets. So have I run this uh, seating stem discussion into the ground enough in our previous 6.5 Creedmoor videos? Cause we had, we had two seating stems. So I've got, I've got three different seating stems for our seating die. Two came with my, with my Hornady custom grade die set. And then I bought one more that is for the 130 and 140 grain uh, ELD and AMAX bullets. This is the one that fits the 143 AMAX the best. Here's the one that had the crappiest fit. You can see how much the bullet moves around. 
I'm not getting intimate contact between that uh, seating stem and the ogive of my bullet. That's not what I want. This is the other one that came with the die set. It's not a bad fit, to be honest. I mean, you could totally use this, but still a little bit, little bit of wiggliness, a little bit of wiggliness. And then the one that, uh, you know, the, the ELD stem that I had bought is a perfect fit. Like it's just, it's intimate contact between that seating stem and the bullet. So that's the one we're going to be using. I'll tell you this, this, uh, this series is my first real experience with Hornady dies. And so far I'm very happy. I'm happy with this micro just seating stem thingy that we bought. It's a pain in the butt to read. Like who in the world at Hornady thought that making those white and it's like one of those, you know, laser etched sort of things. Like, can we not fill that in with some black? Good grief. Who can read that? Now, if it was black like this, it'd be a 10 times better product, but still it's not bad for the price. I'm very, very happy. This, this got me into a micro adjustable seating die a whole lot cheaper than the Forster or the Redding options. So I'm not complaining too loud, but I'm, I'm complaining a little bit. That's an easy fix they could make to this product and make it much better. I don't, did we even talk about it earlier? Like I said, man, I'm sick. You gotta cut me some slack here. Did we even talk about overall length? We're gonna shoot 2.8 inches. That's what the Hornady book says. We actually, back in the first video, shot some of these at 2.8 and 2.9 inches. Didn't see a whole lot of difference in uh, group size. So let's baseline these powders and stuff at the standard 2.8 inches. So I'm 75 thousandths long. All right, let's look at uh, overall length to the tip of the bullet, 2.801, 802, 799, 798 and 799. So that was four thousandths of variation when measured to the tip. Now let's use our bullet comparator here and see how much variation we see to the ogive of the bullet. 2.161, 2.161, 2.162, and 2.162. So we can see overall length measured to the ogive of the bullet. We're only seeing a thousandths of variation. So Good. So I skipped ahead to our maximum charge here just to see if this was a compressed load and it does not look like it is. So that last round and this round, a little bit of, uh, I can feel a little bit of powder movement. So we've got case capacity to move up if we don't hit any pressure or whatever. Then definitely a little bit of room left in the case here with the 143 grain ELDX. So it's boring from here on out. I just need to seat these bullets. I need to weigh out the charges of IMR 4350. I might flip the camera back on that, that top charge. So Hodgson did, you know, say that it was probably going to be compressed. If it's extremely compressed, I might flip the camera back on, let you know, but otherwise I'll just see you guys on the range. Okay. So we're not quite on the range yet. A couple things I want to mention here. I've found this, the IMR 4350 to be significantly bulkier. Tell you what, here's a, here's an up close look at the two powders. You'll see the IMR 4350 granules are much larger. And I tell you what, I'll, I'll load up a case with, I don't know, let's say 43 grains or something where it's well up in the neck. So you can see just the difference in case fill for an equal charge with the two different powders. Yeah, I don't know if 43 is going to fit. Whatever fits whenever I make the picture of it, whatever. You can see it on the screen. That's how much powder is in there. And you can see a pretty significant case fill difference. Now, as far as compression goes, our lowest charge of 4350, 40.6 grains, still a little bit of powder movement whenever I shake it. 40.9, I really don't think there is. And 41.2, there's definitely not. So it looks like right at 41 grains is 100% case fill with the ELDX seated to 2.8 inches. So we're about eight tenths of a grain into being compressed. And what I've found is that our highest charge of 41.8, I'm getting about 2.165 inches of overall length to the ogive. 
where our lighter charge that definitely wasn't compressed, I get 2.162. So we got compressed and we went far enough to where it, uh, you know, the, the, the die and the press wasn't quite able to seat the bullet deep enough at the same exact die setting, but it only, it's only like two, two or three thousandths. I'm going to leave it. I'm going to let it grow a little bit. So same die setting, but with our more compressed charges, we're just a little bit, very little bit longer overall length. Now it's not so compressed that we're seeing any distortion on our bullet from our bullet seating uh, stem. Another really good reason to have a nicely fitting bullet seating stem for with even pressure into a compressed load. If you've got a seating stem where all of the pressure is just like one spot on the bullet, you can get, you can get marks and eventually you'll get little ridges in the bullet or, you know, little valleys in the bullet where the bullet seating stem just put too much pressure on it. None of that going on here. So I think we're good. You know, good grief. This was supposed to be a low effort video. And here I am doing close up glamour shots of powder granules. Good grief. All right, now I just got to finish up seating these guys. And this time we're definitely going to the range. All right, folks, you know the drill by now, right? We've got a target at 100 yards. We are shooting at one inch dots on that target. This is my Thompson Center Compass. It has a 22 inch barrel. We're shooting with my Magneto Speed Chronograph hanging off of my Silencer Co. Omega Suppressor. Our first test charge is 40.3 grains of H4350. I'm shooting in a Caldwell lead sled. I've got a big old bag of shotgun shot to stabilize it. It's been a pretty good platform for us here in the last couple of videos. The scope is a four to 12 by 44 Vortex Crossfire 2. And I gotta be honest with you folks, I've been astounded by the accuracy we've seen out of this scope. So today it continues, it stays on there. So let's get started, 40.3 grains of H4350. All right, not a bad little group to start things off. So I'm getting questions with every video about what the hell this thing is that I keep putting in the chamber. It is called a chamber chiller. It's just a little fan that blows some air through and helps keep things cool. I did do a video on it recently. It seems to be working pretty well for me. So that's what that's all about. And so from, this gun has not been cleaned since the last video, or it wasn't cleaned after the last video, I should say. So dealing with a dirty bore, it was completely cold for this, uh, for this group. I didn't uh, fire any warm up shots or anything like that. Our velocity was 2582 with a 5.7 feet per second standard of deviation. Good stuff. So moving right along, our next group is 40.6 grains. All right, another good standard deviation number of 6.3. So next up is 40.9 grains of H4350. All right, so that group opened up a little bit. Standard deviation got a little bit crappy at 13.3, but we're moving on. Next up, 41.2 grains. Brasses looked fine. 
with everything so far. I'm keeping a pretty close eye on the brass. I'll let you know if something comes up. All right, brass still looking good. So last up is 41.5 grains of H4350. All right, I tell you what, those last couple groups were looking pretty good. Our velocity numbers aren't terrible. 2649 with a 6.5 feet per second standard deviation. I like that. So I'm gonna give this guy a few minutes to cool down. I'm gonna get a fresh battery for that camera. And then we'll switch over to IMR 4350. All right, we've had a couple minutes of cool down time and now we're moving on to IMR 4350. Our first charge is 40.6 grains. So let's see how it shoots. Okay, apparently I'm an idiot who forgot to hit record on the frickin' camera. Uh, all right, we're four shots deep into this first group <laughs> with IMR 4350. All right, here's the fifth shot. All right, 40.9 grains is next. Okay, 41.2 grains. All right, so I took an extended break to make sure that the barrel was completely cool here for these last 10 shots with IMR 4350. We haven't really seen a lot of effect from barrel heat with this gun yet, but you know, still a new gun. And I wanted to give IMR 4350 the best chance I could to shoot some good groups here at the top end. And yeah, we're in good shape now. So, so yeah, next up is 41.5 grains of IMR 4350. Let's see what happens. Nope, doesn't seem to have helped. Still a pretty crappy group, but no pressure signs on that last group. So last up, 21.8 grains of IMR 4350. All right, no, no, uh, no scary pressure signs to speak of. All right, let's get back to the bench and see what we've got. All right, let's start with a look at the brass. These top five rows here are the ones, and there's not gonna be a lot to look at today. Things are looking really good. So let's look at our top charge of H4350. So just like all of the other rounds we've shot through this gun, there is a little bit of cratering. That's just, that's just part of the nature of this gun. Some guns, that would be a pressure sign, but with this one, it's just normal. No discernible flattening of the primers, and yeah, 
just nothing at all to see here looking good here are a couple of the uh, of the pieces from the IMR 4895 very similar look which is to say they look awesome nothing really going on here you can see this one on the right has got just a little bit of a shiny spot kind of a radial shiny spot here towards the edge of the rim this gun seems to do that as well sometimes but at this point I don't think it's a pressure sign I've seen it on low charges I've seen it on high charges it just kind of seems to be a thing but nice round primers a little bit of cratering and nothing else to see here all right let's have a look at the target and I'll tell you what first of all just uh you know the arm's length view of this target more impressive stuff from our thompson center compass this little gun can shoot for being as as cheap as it is the the whole combo gun and scope was 300 dollars. so to get this sort of performance for that sort of money i cannot be happier with this setup it is awesome first of all h4350 it seemed to really tighten up as we were getting to the higher charges, a 0.7 and a 0.674 here with our top two charges, 2693 feet for, or yeah, 2632 feet per second and 2649 feet per second. Velocities are starting to get pretty interesting because if we go back to our factory ammo, yeah, the closest factory ammo we shot was this stuff, the federal non-typical whitetail with 140 grain soft point. This stuff gave us 2,655 feet per second out of our 22 inch barrel. So we we're almost there with H4350, 2,649. And plus we're shooting a 143 grain bullet as opposed to a 140 grain bullet. So if you ran the energy numbers or whatever, this is probably exceeding the factory ammo. And you know what? I've had a commenter or two mention that to get the accuracy performance out of h4350 it really shines on the top end and that seems to be the case here because we went from you know about an inch it opened up to 1.33 inches and then all of a sudden it's tightening up here at the top end and we saw the brass no real pressure signs to speak of so we might be able to push this guy a little bit farther maybe the groups will continue to tighten up it's worth exploring it's definitely worth exploring and Pretty happy with the performance there with H4350. IMR 4350 was a little bit opposite. Started out, its first group was our best group of the day, a 544. That, that's just good shooting, brother. But it just seemed to open up as we went. You know, climbs up to about an inch, and then this last group, which somehow ended up being a 969, but it still wasn't a good looking group at all. Kind of spray, spraying them all over the place. So, where I was hoping with IMR 4350, as we hit a completely full case somewhere about right in here and then started getting lightly compressed, a lot of times that'll point towards accuracy, but in this case, it really didn't. Kind of talking out of my butt here a little bit. Some extruded powders, I've heard, I've read. I haven't really observed it myself enough to be able to, to call it an absolute fact but I've read that a lot of extruded powders, you get up to the compression point and you start crunching them and those little granules of powder start breaking, it can change their burn characteristics and really adversely affect your groups. I don't know if that's what's going on here or not, but it seems like once we started getting compressed, everything kind of, the wheels kind of came off here a little bit on the top end with IMR 4350. And all the way through, we seem to be lagging behind right about 50 feet per second with IMR 4350. So like our top charge of 41.5 grains with H4350 was 2649. And down here, the same charge weight, 41.5 grains was 20, uh, 2548. Or I'm sorry, 2598. So 51 feet per second difference there. And then if we go all the way back here to 40.6 grains, 2596 versus 2548, pretty much the same differential. So for a given charge weight, IMR lagged behind H4350 about 50 feet per second. So it seems to be a little bit slower, right? H4350 is the faster powder, I think. Now, all of this, all of that crap having been said, I would take any load on this sheet and hit the deer woods tomorrow with it. We've got a good shooting gun. This bullet seems to pair up nicely with this gun. 
and I trust Hornady. They tell me this is an expanding hunting bullet. By God, I'd hit the deer woods with any of these loads tomorrow and be completely confident shooting out to three or 400 yards with these. So for a purely hunting, you know, hunting application, anything we shot, I would be happy with. So it's not quite as good as what we saw in the last video with the 135 grain burger, classic hunter, right? In that video, we didn't shoot a single group over an inch. So it's, you know, it's not quite the perfect match that the 135 burger seems to be, but that's a $50 box of bullets. Yeah, $50 box of bullets versus $30 box of bullets. We've got to cut the ELDX a little bit of slack here, I think. So, I mean, overall, uh, you know, there's no goofy group. There's no, go there's no group that we need to ignore or worry about. Like, it's all very, very consistent. Like, you look at our point of impact from 2,582 feet per second up to 2,649. Very stable point of impact. Even the same thing with IMR 4350. It did seem to kind of take a little climb here. You know, the point of impact shifted up a little bit here, but nothing crazy, nothing drastic. And to me, that points to a, a forgiving setup. Like, let's say we loaded 40.9 uh, grains of H4350, and we had variations due to temperature or whatever. The point of impact really isn't shifting. So this just seems to be an incredibly forgiving gun. This seems to be a bullet that it kind of likes. It likes certainly well enough. So just overall, very happy with the performance. And I'll tell you what, over two, so now we're, we've had two firings on our Starline brass with the small rifle primers. I guess I could brighten up the camera a little bit now, couldn't I? There we go. Yeah, our Starline brass seems to be doing a great job for us, a really good job for us. We didn't do any sorting. We didn't do any advanced brass prep. All we did was take these stupid things out of the package and start loading them. And we've shot nothing but impressive groups. That's the way I see it. Our Hornady dies. You know, we've loaded up enough and we've shot enough. Now I think I feel completely confident saying, heck yeah, if you're getting into 6.5 Creedmoor, get you a set of custom grade dies. Get you the, uh, get you that micro just seating micrometer. I'll have links for all this crap down in the description. I couldn't be happier with it. Is it the very best stuff you can buy? No, but it's affordable and it's getting the job done. It is definitely getting the job done. Oh crap, folks. All right, I'm done. We're, 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 we're finished. There will not be a video tomorrow. I'm struggling. I'm going to spend tomorrow in bed trying to get over this, the last of this crap here. It's been so long since I was sick, I forgot how much it sucks. So that's where we wrap this up. If you'd like to help support my channel, you can come to patreon.com slash reloading. You can check out my the description. Down below the video, you click on the show more button there where it says show more, and you'll see a whole bunch of crap down in my description. I generally have links for the junk, for the most important crap that we've used for that day's video and affiliate links to some of the uh, the big retailers. I recently added in uh, Optics Planet, Brownells, Natchez Shooter Supplies. These are good places to shop. They are, they really are. And if you click on my link to get you there, they give me a little referral fee and it adds up quick. So, all right guys, I'll see you next time.